program that is going through accreditation right now. Um, so if you want more information about that, there's information on our website. And I think that if, if you have more questions about that specifically, then the director or one of the other representatives will be able to help you, will be able to answer your questions. So I'm sharing my screen. If you um, can see it, please give me a thumbs up just so I know if you can see it as well. All right, perfect. Well, I have 30 minutes, so I'm gonna to try to use the best of my time to, or the most of my time to uh, go over the presentation. And as Jessica said, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So OSU College of Osteopathic Medicine, it's the only osteopathic medical school in the state. Um, this is our main campus in Tulsa. It's our medical academic building. Um, if it wasn't a COVID world, this is where we would have all of the classes, but students are still coming onto campus for the osteopathic manipulative lab, as well as their um, clinical skills lab. Um, in the very top hand left corner, you can see in the right, or excuse me, the top left hand corner is our OSU Medical Center. And that's also where it's our hospital and it's one of the largest osteopathic teaching hospitals associated with the medical school. So I put this picture up here because I really wanted to show just the community that OSU has the very, you know, if you ask anybody that attends medical school, they talk about the supportive environment, they talk about the different opportunities that students can get involved. These are third year students, but last year they participated in a, in a health fair. Um, so you can participate in many different opportunities because we have so many different clubs on our campus. Um, these are students on the left that went to Washington DC last year for DO on the Hill. And this is where they were advocating to legislators about the importance of osteopathic medicine. And this is a student that is um, standing by Dr. Pete, giving the go poke sign. Really, we have a lot of opportunities um, for medical students in our program. So that's why I wanted to put this up here because the heartbeat of our program is our medical students. So if you're familiar with osteopathic medicine, you're familiar with the theory, and I'll explain more about this, about the mind, body, and spirit. So these are two second year medical students in the clinical skills lab um, showing osteopathic medicine on one of the task trainers. But if, as far as our program as a whole, we have a very extensive wellness program. Um, the wellness program is committed to creating a healthy campus culture for the whole campus, not only for medical students, but also for our graduate students. Um, if you're familiar with OSU in general, it is America's healthiest campus, and that definitely resonates with all of the programs that we offer to our medical students. If you've not visited our school, then I would encourage you to visit our school. We're still offering in-person tours, and TCC is one of the schools that we reached out to to offer um, tours for TCC students. You can either do one with TCC in general, or you can have an individual tour. The TCC um, tour is specifically that day was designated for students that are attending TCC. They're going to be broken up into small groups and then our student ambassador is going to actually be leading the groups. So when you're on campus, you'll see the clinical skills lab, you'll see the hospital simulation centers, and you'll also see the um, um, exam rooms where students are practicing or students are getting practice um, as medical students. Osteopathic medical, uh, manipulative medicine, as I mentioned, we're an osteopathic college. So there, this, as you can see with the medical student, he's using his hands and I'll be, I'll ex be explaining more about that. The supportive environment that goes back to the first um, slide that I was showing with the students. One of the things, and I think this is really important to mention is as a first year medical student, you're connected to many different mentors. We wanna make sure that as a medical student that you are set up for, for success from the beginning. So as a first year medical student, you're connected to a second year mentor, you have a faculty mentor, you also have a um, osteopathic mentor that is currently practicing. We know that as a medical student, there's a lot of, it's a lot of challenges um, because medical school is not easy, but we wanna make sure that with the different supportive systems that you have is we're setting you up for success. OSU's mission 
is to train physicians to go back to rural and underserved Oklahoma. So this is pointing to his feet. So he's gonna go back after he graduates to go back to rural and underserved communities. But whether you decide to practice in a rural or underserved community, in osteopathic medicine, you can practice any specialty that you're interested in. After graduating, I'll be talking more about our match rate. So after you graduate, that's when you get a job. That's when you get to start working on in that particular specialty that you're interested in. The picture that I'm showing here um, is in one of our hospital simulation centers in the operating room. So um, I think that once you get a chance to visit campus, see our high fidelity mannequins, see the equipment and all of the training they get to use, you'll know that you're getting prepared for a successful future. So how many of you are familiar with osteopathic manipulative medicine just by kind of a show of hands? Maybe a little bit. One person kind of shook her hand a little bit. So osteopathic manipulative medicine, it has not only a philosophical and a practical, practical component um, when it, upon its teaching, but it was founded by an MD, actually. His name is Andrew Steele, and he believed in the holistic approach to medicine. Um, he had three children that actually died, and so he was kind of getting very frustrated with modern medicine, and so he wanted to start learning more about the anatomy, more about the musculoskeletal system, and more about the holistic approach to uh, taking care of patients. So the philosophy of osteopathic medicine is the body is a unit, and that's why I put the mind, body, and spirit. It's capable of self-regulation and self-healing and, and health maintenance. If you think about when you, if you cut your hand, maybe like a paper cut, and how it begins to start healing itself, that's one of the, the powerful things about your body is it has the ability to do that. We know with the body is that the structure and function are reciprocally interrelated. So if something is not working properly within the function of the way your body is running, or operating is that also affects the structure. And then the rationale treatment is based on the understanding of the first three principles. So here's a physician, he is at New York um, College of Osteopathic Medicine and he's using osteopathic manipulative medicine um, on a patient, probably in one of their labs. So he's an attending with one of the students that's learning. Um, in this particular case is that He's talking to his patient about the techniques, um, how it's used to restore normal function of the muscles, the bones, and the joints through various techniques and resistance and stretching. As a first year medical student, your first week of medical school is you're starting to learn about osteopathic manipulative medicine. You're also going to have one full semester of anatomy. And the nice thing about that is the things that you're learning in anatomy especially when it pertains to the musculoskeletal system, are the same things that you're going to start learning in OMM, so they are interrelated. So the restoration of the biomedical structures promote restoration of other systems throughout the body. So that's really important to know as you're starting to learn more about OMM. So in this particular case, in relating back to the mind, body, and spirit, is that we took a case related to COVID because that's very relevant right now. Um, so one of the things when physicians are talking to their patients related to a COVID case is they wanna know more about what do they think is going on? How much pain are they feeling? Are they anxious? Um, does COVID affect their awareness of the world around them? You know, when they talk about the holistic approach, it really is, everything is inter, interrelated to each other. So the mind, that's really, a, that's really important because the mind, um, if, they're, if they are anxious or if they are in pain, then that could actually affect other places in your body. So that goes back to my next slide, as far as the body is a unit. How well does the patient breathe? Are accessory muscles being used to help? These are questions that the physician may be asking their patient because again, everything is interrelated. As far as the spirit, how will a COVID-19 COVID diagnosis affect the patient's living? Are they able to still go to church, practice the religion? You may have heard that or may know someone that has COVID or just even the, the, the whole three or four months that we've had to quarantine where it was really affecting people that are, are outgoing and they're used to being around other people and then having to quarantine having to not be around people. In a lot of cases, that's really been hard for people. So these are things that we take into consideration as osteopathic medicine and how we treat patients. 
So OSU Open is opening a second location in Tahlequah. It's the first tribally affiliated medical school in the country. It has, we have a partnership with the Cherokee Nation. And there's up to 50 students that, entered each, that are going to be entering each class. For the class of 2024, there was 54 students. So you can see the picture of the building. Um, it's under construction when I took this building last month but students are, or actually faculty will be moving in in December, and then students will be attending um, lectures, or not lectures, but labs in the spring. Um, because of COVID, they'll still be listening to lectures online, but at least um, from, the, from the lab side, they'll be able to go into the building. So this was a picture taken earlier this summer, um, and the construction was definitely was halted because of COVID, so it's not as progressed as it is here. But at least you can see where it's located on the campus in Tahlequah. In the middle building is the WW Hastings Hospital, and then on the right is the Cherokee Medical Facility. So not only does it have, is it the hospital, but it also has optometry, dentist, it's a very comprehensive medical facility. So if you are interested in learning about other tracks besides the traditional track at OST, we have a rural medical track, we have a global health track, and a tribal medicine track. So if you are from a small town in Oklahoma and you are already aware of the health disparities and may have an interest in going back to a rural community to practice, then the rural medical track may be for you. You don't actually decide if you're interested in the rural medical track until the first semester of your second year. And that's where you're really going to see the differences of the rural medical track is getting connected to a rural advisor, start working on your um, rotations that you're going to be doing in your third year. And then in your third year is when you're going to be, is where you're actually going to see that difference because you're going to be doing rotations in a rural community. One of the Biggest advantages, there are many advantages about the rural medical track, but one of the biggest advantages with the rural medical track is a more one-on-one -on -one, um, training in rural communities, and then also just the opportunities to start building relationships in communities that you may want to go back and practice, getting to know um, preceptors and having more one-on-one -on -one time with these physicians in these areas. The global health track is fairly new, so if you're interested in international medicine and going in and learning about international healthcare systems. The Global Health Track is a program that you may be interested in. And then the last thing that I'll mention is the Tribal Medicine Track. This is something new that we're, that's in development. Um, similar to the Rural med Medical Track where you're going into rural communities with the Tribal Health Track is that you're actually going to be going to, you're actually able to do a large number of your rotations at tribal sites and starting to work with Native American populations. So if that's something that's of interest to you, um, applications will start going out next spring for our current medical students for them to start doing as rotations in their third and fourth year. So one of the things that I like to tell students that are preparing to apply to OSU, whether it's for the fall or for another time frame, is we wanna know what your passion is for medicine, what your interest is, have you had the opportunity to shadow an MD or a DO? What kind of volunteer work are you currently doing? Or clinical experience? And when I talk about clinical experience, I'm referring more to the one-on-one -on -one, um, patient interaction. If you're interested in research, what kind of research or projects have you done? As an undergrad, are you involved in any leadership roles or involvement on campus? And then the last, are you interested in rural medicine? Not everyone that attends OSU is interested in rural medicine, but we wanna know if that's something that you're interested in. From an academic side, the minimum GPA is a 3.0 and the MCAT score is a 492. For the incoming class of 2024, the overall GPA is a 3.68 and um, MCAT is a 501. So here are the prerequisite requirements. Since you're at TCC, then you're going to be taking your first two years um, with prerequisites and getting science classes in. Um, so we require two semesters of not only English comp, your biology with labs, chemistry, ochem, physics. To apply to OSC, we only need one upper division science class. However, we do prefer three to five. Um, and that's only an advantage to you because it'll help you not only prepare for medical school, but then, or for the, for the um, MCAT, but then also 
building that depending on the classes that you're taking building that foundation before you get to medical school so you understand more about those sciences something that's new uh, that started last year is the casper test and that is a situational judgment test it's not anything that you can prepare for it's more it's asking more about ethical questions and what you would do in particular scenarios um, as far as applying to osu is the primary application to complete is ACOMAS, and that's the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medical Application Service. If you apply to an MD program, that is going to be another application service, um, but we have already started interviewing for the fall of 2021. The deadline to submit your application is February 28th, but I would highly recommend going ahead and submitting your application before the deadline with the goal of getting an interview. So on your supplemental application, it will ask you which campuses you are interested in. You can choose Tahlequah, Tulsa, or no preference. Ultimately, if you get an invitation and then um, they decide to sit and extend an offer to you, then they'll choose the campus um, that you've been selected to go. So there have been some adaptations to the admissions process because of COVID, and this is where you're going to see those questions on your ACOMAS or primary application. And so we are going to be accepting all coursework, including labs that you did online. Um, as far as the application process for this cycle is that if you do not have your MCAT score at the time that you apply, but we, um, if your transcript has been reviewed and approved, you have um, a high academic metric or other experiences that you can promote or, or mention on your application, then those will be considered. And you may be invited for an interview before you get your MCAT score. One thing that I want to mention is that in order for them to extend an offer to you, you will need to have an MCAT. There are some new questions that are also going to be on the application um, related to COVID. So as an example, um, from an academic side, were you able to interact with your professors? From a professionalist, did you hold a job? Or from per on a personal level, did you have to move out of the house or dorm? All of these are factors as to um, how it affected you and maybe some challenges that you faced that um, really challenged your academic schoolwork or even from a personal standpoint. So something that is also worth mentioning, if you are a resident from Kansas, Missouri, or Arkansas, and you are accepted to OSU, if you have a minimum score of 500 on your MCAT with a minimum of a 3.5, if you are accepted to OSU, you can qualify for this out-of-state waiver if you're from one of these three states. So that's pretty huge because you're not only saving um, a lot of money by getting in-state tuition, but you also get to go to a great school in the process. So there's several different pathways toward getting your DO degree. Um, the three plus one program. So this is something that is offered to students at one of our partner universities and it is listed online the different universities that offer the three plus one program. But basically with the three plus one program is that you complete three years of your undergrad coursework at one of the universities. You apply to OSU in your sophomore year. You need to have at least a 3.5 GPA and a 3.5 science GPA at the time that you complete your application. If, you, if your interview goes well, then you're provisionally accepted for the next year. And so you'll go back to, um, you'll finish your spring semester, your junior year at your undergrad university. And then in your junior year also, you'll take your MCAT. The advantages of going into the three plus one program is that if you took concurrent classes in high school, have an interest in medicine, are interested in finishing sooner, then you're shaving off or basically cutting off a year of um, undergrad to go to medical school. Um, it, you are going to be considered for admission under a, with a smaller group of applicants. And then also it's a guaranteed interview if all of the academic criteria is met. So just to go over the criteria again, is you need to have a minimum of a 3.5, um, submit your application by February 28th, Take the CASPER situational judgment test. And one thing I, I forgot to mention is that 
every school that has a um, has an agreement for three plus one, then there's a degree plan that, that you need to finish within their with with that institution. For instance, if you're working on a biology degree, they want to make sure that you're completing the biology requirements the first three years that you're on the campus. The coursework that you take as a first year medical school will transfer back for your credits to earn your degree from your undergrad institution. So another pre-admission option is a guaranteed interview. Um, unlike the three plus one program is you're actually applying for a guaranteed interview in your senior year or six months after you graduate. You need to have at least a 3.5 GPA and at least a 500 to be able to qualify for this program. Now, the guaranteed interview is also offered to a select number of in-state institutions. And one thing I also want to mention is we have over 3,500 applicants to OSU. Not everyone's going to get an interview. So knowing that you have met the academic requirements of this program, then, you're, then you know that you're at least guaranteed an interview and that takes a lot of stress um, if you're going to be getting an interview at OSU or not. Some other things to consider are the dual degree programs. I'll quickly go over these, uh, but this is listed on our website if you're interested. In addition to getting your um, DO degree, is we you can get a Master's of Business Administration or Healthcare Administration or Biomedical Sciences or Public Health. The three that I just mentioned, if you're accepted to OSU, then you'll actually enroll in one of the other programs first and you'll complete that program and then the next year you'll matriculate to OSU's medical school. The Doctor of Philosophy or basically the PhD program is different because you're going to medical school your first two years and then your next three to five years is when you're working on research and then after you complete your research then the next the last two years are you're doing your rotation so it's a little bit different but you still have the same opportunity to be able to learn more about OSU. We now offer a graduate certificate in medical sciences program. So this is a one year preparatory program to prepare students for medical school. Um, if you do well in this program, earn an A or a B and at least a 498 on your MCAT, then you're guaranteed an interview for the next, for the next school year. Now, one thing about this is that it's very similar to a master's program, but you're getting a certificate in the me uh, medical science program. Another advantage is, is that you're getting to meet faculty, you're still, have, you're still connected to all of the resources um, that OSU offers through this program, um, and then also just getting, if you don't have a strong GPA or um, then this is an opportunity to get a strong foundation in biomedical sciences as well to be able to prove to the admissions team that you can handle the challenges of medical school curriculum. If you are, if you apply to, through the traditional program and admissions team feels like you can benefit from the graduate certificate program, then they actually may recommend you to the guaranteed admission or the bridge program. That is the same preparatory program as I mentioned in, the, in this slide. It's just the entry of the way that you are accepted into the program. Through this program, you have to apply through the graduate college as an at-large applicant. And then this program is that you actually apply to medical school um, if, and then the admissions team will refer you to one, to one of these other programs as a first year, med or excuse me, um, before you begin medical school. The last thing I will mention is that um, since 2016, OSU's had a 100% placement rate for students that are graduating from OSU. The reason why I bring this up is because in 2019, students that were graduating from medical school and going into the National Resident Matching Program, whether that's um, an MD or DO program, there were over 3,000 positions that were not filled. So that's why I wanted to bring up, this is really important of OSU graduates and knowing that after you graduate, you will get a job into a residency program. I know I'm almost out of time, so the last slide I'm going to leave it, with, leave it here, or end with, sorry, end it, is that if you are interested in scheduling an advisement, this is my information, and then also the recruitment specialist. This is her information. 
We have some upcoming virtual events. Um, next week we'll have information on research. So if you're interested in learning about research projects from OSU, then this is going to be students that are talking about the projects that they have done, as well as the director of the research program. Um, and then in November, we're going to be covering global health. So if you're interested in the, our global health program or learning more about our wellness program, then those are the remaining virtual events that we have for this semester. So I will leave it there and try to cut off as much and stay within 30 minutes as possible. Um, but I, that's all I have for now, but I'm definitely open for, um, so as I mentioned, I, we are scheduling advisements, we're doing in-person tours, um, and then as far as from an event side, um, you can go online to find out about the virtual events that we are hosting for you to, to be involved and learn more about OSU. Thank you, Julie. And, and Julie is going to hang around. Uh, so that way, when we do the question and answer portion at the end of this session, uh, she will be here to, to answer some of those questions for you guys. Yes. Uh, but up next, we have Candace from OU School of Medicine, or College of Medicine. Um, so I will uh, let her take over and share her screen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen hopefully it will work um let's see all right i think i think we're good um you might hear some extra noise uh, we are having a meeting in our office right now but I just want to introduce myself. My name is Candace Teets. I am a recruitment and admissions coordinator um, at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. I've been here for almost two years now, and I've been uh, working with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. And I've recently moved over to the College of Medicine admissions office. Um, you'll notice that there may be um, well, actually, let me double check uh, that there we may have another coordinator in the chat. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'll also give time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so a little bit about the uh, College of Medicine. We are located at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City. We also have a campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma um with, through our school of community medicine so we've partnered with um tulsa university and the university of oklahoma to create the school of community medicine and i'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two programs in just a minute um, but we are uh, one of seven institutions on the health sciences center campus excuse me um, and we are um, we sort of one of the one of the few on a comprehensive health uh, center um, so a little bit about the requirements for um, admission to the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. Um, on the screen, you can see that there are a number of, of minimum requirements. And I want to point out that um, the word of emphasis here is minimum. This does not include um, require what's the word I want to use? This does not uh, capture what it takes to become a competitive applicant, uh, but I will go over sort of what makes a successful applicant and what makes a more competitive applicant um, a little on later on in the presentation. Um, generally speaking, our students begin uh, the application process in the spring semester of their junior year, uh, and we'll go over the timeline, but the minimum requirements as uh, stated by the state of Oklahoma uh, Board of Regents for Higher Education uh, holds that our, our applicants must be a um, U.S. citizen or hold a permanent visa. If you are um, not a U.S. citizen or you might be what is considered a DACA student or a dreamer, um, unfortunately we do not accept DACA students, but we do have resources for our students who are um, not U.S. citizens and we can kind of point you in the right direction and help you along the way um, to, to getting into the medical school um, that does accept those, those specialized students. Um, you must have a minimum GPA of a 3.0 or higher, 
letter grade of C or better in the required prerequisite courses, and I will go over those required prerequisite courses in just a minute, and then an MCAT score of at least a 492. However, um, again, this is not a competitive score. Uh, we base our interviews off of the uh, national average, and so that um, sort of fluctuates one or two points year to year this year. Our minimum MCAT score that we are accepting is a 501. Um, and then recommendation letters. You must have at least one pre-med committee and one faculty letter or three faculty letters. If you have a letter of recommendation from somebody in the community, a community physician, that's okay too. It's just not going to count towards those uh, recommendation letters that are required for your application. So that can be um, part of your supplemental um, application. That's totally fine. We will still accept it and take a look at it. Um, it just won't count towards that requirement. Um, so this is the list of the prerequisite courses. Each of these courses are going to um, prepare you for the rigorous study of medical school and also the MCAT course. Uh, down at the bottom here, this recommended biochemistry and writing intensive course is actually going to better prepare you for the MCAT because those two sections, there's a car section and a biochemistry section, make up a large portion of the MCAT score. Um, or the MCAT exam. So um, some of these are going to be covered in uh, your gen ed courses and some of these are going to be covered in depending on the um, the major that you choose uh, in your undergrad. Um, some of these will be covered in that. That's why a large number of our students um, typically did major in biochemistry, biology, those types of things, because these um, prerequisites are already um, found in that degree plan. But it should be noted that you can major in whatever is um, interesting to you, just as long as these prerequisites are met and you have at least a seat or better in that class. Um, so a little bit about the Oklahoma City campus. Um, we are a comprehensive academic medical center. We have a number of specialty experiences. Uh, we have 53 ACGME accredited specialty and subspecialty programs. Uh, this is uh, going to be considered for your residency and fellowship after medical school. So um, that's something if if you are interested in um, you know participating or I'm sorry if you're interested in a specific subspecialty or specialty, um, it's likely that we have we have what you're looking for. Um, and many of our students stay with us after medical school, um, but you know, several go on to, to other things as well. We have research opportunities um, both within um, the uh, HSC framework, and then we also have partnered with uh, the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, which is located on our campus as well. And then, of course, we have our MD PhD dual uh, degree program. It is a very rigorous program, and I'll briefly touch on it in just a minute. Um, but that does allow for you to have um, research experiences while you are sort of going through the MD program. It is a seven year program, so it does add a little bit of time to your degree program, but well worth it if you're looking to go into academic medicine um, or to perform research on your own. And then we also have the Community Health Alliance, which is an alliance between several different clinics on campus that give our students hands-on um, experience, uh, as well as um, uh, working with patients uh, directly. And so now on to the School of Community Medicine, which many of you might find very, very informational considering um, uh, it is located in Tulsa, but uh, it is in a community-based setting. And sort of the difference between um, the Oklahoma City campus and the, the Tulsa campus is, uh, is that community-based setting. The curriculum is all going to be the same. Your admissions requirements are all going to be the same. There's just more of a community-based focus and um, all of their research clinics, et cetera, those are all focused within that community health aspect. Um, they also offer a summer institute uh, for, for their students who are interested. It brings faculty and students together for an immersion community, in community medicine. Um, and that begins, I believe, the summer before you matriculate into your first year of um, medical school or before you enroll. Um, and so that is a, additionally something that you can add to your resume as well as you are, or your CV as you're sort of going through medical school. Uh, they also have, um, they have Bedlam clinics where we have the Community Health Alliance and different clinics through, through that network. They have the Bedlam clinics in Tulsa. Uh, the Bedlam E clinic is, they're both student-led clinics. Um, the Bedlam E clinic is an evening walk-in clinic and the Bedlam L free clinic is um, more of a longitudinal 
longitudinal uh, care facility. So you will have the same patients um, sort of from beginning to end um, as long as you are participating in the Bedlam clinics. Uh, so there's a little bit of differences there, but both are student led, both give you hands on experience with uh, physicians and patients as well. And we have much smaller class sizes at the School of Community Medicine. So Oklahoma City has, uh, we have space for about 140 students each year, uh, give or take a few. Uh, and in Tulsa, we have a space for around 25 to 30 students each year. So it creates that, uh, that individualized attention that most students really enjoy. Um, you won't be overlooked in, in the School of Community Medicine, um, for better or worse, right? They're going to they're gonna know when you're not in class. Uh, you can't hide behind a large class size, uh, but it does allow our faculty members to reach out when, when a student is struggling. It makes it a little bit easier for them to do that. And of course, it creates a small rotation of teams, um, again, for that individualized attention. So uh, to get a picture of sort of what makes a competitive applicant, as I mentioned before, I want you to take a look at our applicant pool. Um, this is just a little bit outdated. This is from the class of 2023. So um, there, these students who matriculated are first year students this year. Um, so, or I'm sorry, they are second year students this year. Our first year students are gonna be the class of 2024. That gets very confusing. Um, but this is the uh, a good picture of our applicant pool. Um, the average GPA uh, typically for residents is about a 3.6 for those who, um, who apply. Uh, as you can see, there is a large difference between non-residents and residents. Um, According to the state of Oklahoma, we are required to accept 75% of our incoming class from uh, Oklahoma residents and then 25 from out of state. So um, we do get a large number of non-resident applications. We get about 3,000 applications every year, application cycle, um, and the large majority of those come from non-residents. So those applicants are going to be um, much more competitive versus uh, the the uh, the residents. I'm sorry, got a little pop up there. Um, so so those those what was I saying? So we have a smaller number of students who apply as residents. So there's a little bit. Um, I won't say that there's a little bit of leeway, but it is slightly less competitive than those who apply from out of state. If that makes sense. Um, and this just kind of gives you a good breakdown uh, between uh, male and female, and uh, and not resident non resident gives you a picture of the applicant pool. Again, these are averages. So we have students who have much higher MCAT scores and much lower MCAT scores. These are just those who completed their application and, and, and supplemental application with us. Come on, where'd you go? Nope, I think I skipped it. Nope, okay. So these are the interview pool for the class of 2023. Um, so you can see the numbers kind of increase because we are picking the best of the best. Uh, we have room to interview about 300 students every cycle. So um, we took about half of our Oklahoma residents who applied and much like, I don't even, think that's 1% <laughs> of our out-of-state residents. So uh, you can see that the focus is really on Oklahoma residents, but if you're an out-of-state resident, um, take a look at this MCAT score. So it is much higher than the, the Oklahoma resident um, who's been interviewed. Again, these are averages, so we are looking at uh, more than one thing to, to issue you an interview, and I'll go over those requirements in just a minute. Um, and again, it, it breaks down um, by gender so that you can get a, a good picture of sort of what, um, what our class sort of looks like. Moving on, this is the matriculated class for 2023. So these would be our second year students. Um, we accepted 154 Oklahoma residents and 11 non-residents. Um, now the, the, the GPA typically year to year uh, for an overall GPA, usually our students are sitting right at about a 3.7. Again, it's an average. So we have some who are above and below that. And our average MCAT score is usually about a 509 that fluctuates year to year. Um, so, so you can kind of, uh, 
our brochures will always um, be updated with the most up-to-date information. So if you are looking to um, sort of compare yourself to the competitive applicants, this is a great uh, picture to sort of take a look at if you're interested in coming to medical school. Take a look at that average MCAT score. Take a look at that average um, overall GPA. And then also take a look at that average um, science GPA, which is this column here. Um, again, it's sitting at about a 3.7. So um, when you are let's talk about our successful applicants just to kind of move a little bit forward. Uh, we do expect our successful applicants to have a competitive GPA. Again, it's going to look a lot like that uh, interviewed pool. So with your GPA and MCAT score sort of sitting right at, at those marks, those benchmarks, um, we have this listed on our website. So don't worry, you don't have to jot down any notes right now. If, if, you, if you are taking notes, uh, you can always refer back to our website. Um, and we ask that our students have a, a good amount of healthcare experience. Now, uh, we do not require a specific amount of healthcare experience as far as hours go. Um, some medical schools do. We do not require that. We just ask that it be quality quality work to healthcare experience. Healthcare experience that speaks to you, that you are going to be able to speak to in an interview, um, and that piques your interest because you're going to be better, better at it and better at answering that in an interview uh, process. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about where you can start with that. Uh, we understand that you know right now it's a very difficult time for um, students to gain healthcare experience, but don't discount little things that you do um, like research uh, at your institution, um, shadowing experiences, always talk to your primary care physician first. That's your first point of contact with the medical field. Um, so always ask them. We'll also accept uh, medical and healthcare experience outside of um, physician contact. So if you are shadowing a nurse, if you are working in a clinic, if you are a scribe, if you are a, one of those cane stripers, um, that all counts. Uh, we want to see, what I can tell you is that our interview board um, is generally looking for direct patient contact and direct physician contact. We want you to uh, have a good, decent idea of what it is that you're getting yourself into, and we want you to have that direct access to a physician so that you can ask questions and, and gain experience that way. Um, I talked a little bit about this before. So why is healthcare experience important? We want our students to understand that it is real life medicine. It's different than what you'll see on scrubs. It's different, hopefully, uh, it's different than what you would see on um, uh, The Good Doctor or Grey's Anatomy. Um, they deal with people very differently than they would in a TV setting. Um, and of course, we want you to see that day-to-day -day interaction as well. Um, we also want you to be exposed to those experiences so that you know that you can handle it as you move forward. Um, we also find that it is very helpful in the medical school interview. Um, and you're going to be asked questions related to your healthcare experience and understanding what the healthcare uh, system is like working in it um, at the clinic on the clinical side and and that type of thing and we also want you to understand that medical education is a huge commitment it is a huge time commitment a huge financial commitment and a huge personal commitment um, for yourself as well uh, we do have students who uh, do various wonderful things they go off and have families while they're in medical school and that's great um, but we want you to understand what the commitment is beforehand um, so that you're not overwhelmed um, in medical school um, I mentioned before who you can approach um, as possible mentors. First and foremost, your doctor or your pediatrician um, that you, you've very well established probably established a good uh, working relationship. Uh, it would be sort of an easy in uh, to, to their clinic. However, a lot of physicians are not accepting shadowing uh, students right now. And so um, don't, don't be uh, offended or take it personally if they tell you no. Also, sometimes certain clinics will, will tell you no for various reasons. It's a liability, that type of thing. So just know that there's more than, there, it's not because they don't like you, they, their hands are kind of tied on, on some things. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned before, any volunteer experience that you can gain in the healthcare 
uh, in a healthcare facility will count towards your healthcare experience. And we want you to understand what it's like to be in the life and times of a professional. Ask those physicians um, what made them go into medicine, what made them go into their, their specialty field, uh, what are they looking for in future doctors, that type of thing. It will also teach you how to learn to take positive and negative feedback in a constructive way. Uh, don't be surprised if you're shadowing a physician and they ask you to dress more professionally. Um, that's not uncommon because you don't know what you don't know until someone tells you. And so um, don't take it personally if that happens. Um, they're doing it for your betterment, betterment and for your benefit. Um, so back to um, discussing what our successful applicants look like. Uh, we want you to also, uh, our successful applicants take great advantage from uh, their um, their pre-med committee and their faculty members. And so we want you to get letters of recommendation from a faculty member that knows you personally and can speak to your work ethic. Um, we also ask that you get letters of recommendation from the pre-med committee because they know what it's like to go through this process um, and they also can speak to your character in a way that maybe your your professor may not have been able to because they've spent um, a different amount of time with you than a faculty member. And then we ask that you be uh, well prepared for your interview. Uh, the AAMC has a list of core competencies that every individual who applies to medical school um, is asked. And so that is, go ahead and read through that list of questions that will very well prepare you for the interview. Everyone is asked those same interview questions. Also be prepared to read through uh, your, um, your resume and your transcripts because you're going to be asked questions based on those things. Be sure that you know what is in your personal statement because you're going to be asked questions on your personal statement. Um, so don't just go in blind, come in well prepared. Um, and so sort of going back to that, um, adhere to those admissions uh, deadlines and check for grammar. You wouldn't believe how many students submit things with uh, spell, spelling errors or grammar er grammatical errors. So just be sure that you're double checking that if you would like. It always helps to have a second or third pair of eyes read over all of your um, paperwork that you're submitting. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the interview. So we issue interviews um, based on what we call a cognitive score. So that would be uh, based off of 70% MCAT and 30% science GPA. Those two combined will issue you a, a, a cognitive score and then you'll be offered an interview based on that score. We do um, highest to lowest score um, and that's how we order our inter our interviews. Um, so that MCAT is going to be vitally important. We will accept the most recent MCAT score. Um, so if you did pretty well the first time and you want to try again, maybe don't <laughs> because we will accept that first or uh, that latest MCAT score and not necessarily your highest. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're, you know, choosing, choosing your test your testing procedures. Also, um, because that MCAT score is so vitally important, um, I always advise students to treat it almost like a full-time job. So, um, you know, make sure that you are making that a priority to study, not just a couple hours a week as you, uh, in the weeks leading up to uh, the MCAT. It is an eight hour exam. So we wanna make sure that you have the stamina built up to sit for an eight hour exam. And also that your your mind is fresh. Um, so you need to be sort of exercising that muscle uh, daily. Studying a little bit here and there is not going to work. Um, it's not like other exams. So just be sure that you are giving it the priority that it deserves. Um, also, uh, many of our students have found that it is incredibly helpful to uh, take your MCAT book, whatever materials that you have, have utilized for studying for the MCAT, and compare it sort of side by side uh, with some of the coursework that you are working in. So if you're in the middle of a prerequisite um, and you find that you're in that biochemistry, say you're taking biochemistry and you're in the biochemistry portion of your MCAT um, study prep, put them side by side and see how you can um, apply what you're learning in your class to the MCAT prep um, and, and uh, uh, practice exams and see how that best prepares you. A lot of time it re times it re-emphasizes um, exactly what you're studying and uh, prepares you for both great success in your class and on the exam. 
Um, we issue interviews from October to January. We actually are in the middle of our very first uh, admissions interview today. Um, so it's been a little bit hectic. So if I'm slurring my words and all of those things, it's because I'm extra tired. Uh, <laughs> so that is kind of what, what, we, uh, what our timeline is. Uh, we offer those interviews in October into January. Uh, in years past, if there have been snow days, et cetera, it can bleed over into February. So our first round of applicants will probably know here around Thanksgiving whether they've been accepted or not. Our next round of uh, interviews will know sometime before Christmas, and then our last round of interviews will know sometime before spring breaks, just to give you an idea of when you'll know. Um, and then our interviews are semi-blind. So the first portion of your interview is going to be blind. The interview committee knows that you've sort of met the minimum threshold, uh, but they are not looking at your CV or your um, resume. They're not looking at your letters of recommendation. They're not looking at your transcripts. They are just asking you questions based on core competencies and to see what your reaction is. Then they will take a break, come back after they've looked over all of your application material and ask you questions about that. In your interview committee, you will have one faculty member, a community doctor, and then a fourth year medical student to kind of give you a, a well-rounded, um, sort of I like to think of it as a sounding board, a well-rounded um, panel uh, to, to ask you questions. Um, and then I, of course I mentioned those core competencies earlier. Um, be sure that you are practicing your interview as much as possible. Uh, coming from someone who is a performance major, it always uh, helps to practice out loud, even though it makes you feel silly, it's going to better prepare you for the real world environment. And also think about typical interview questions and have those, those responses well organized and ready to go at the drop of a hat. Um, it also doesn't hurt to think of questions you would ask someone in your position and also what questions you would ask of your interview committee as well. And then again, be ready to explain anything in your academics, your personal statement, um, your resume, anything that might raise questions, um, be ready to explain and uh, give details about that. Um, if you uh, have gone through the application process and you were not offered an interview or you were offered an interview and you were waitlisted or denied, um, we do have more resources for you. We're not just going to leave you high and dry. Uh, we invite each of our students to come back for a reapplicant workshop that will happen in the spring um, in about April. Uh, it will help you to identify strengths and weaknesses of your application. We'll actually get to look at the notes from your interview um, to give you uh, crit uh, constructive criticism and feedback uh, to better prepare you for the next time. And many of our students have found that it has been incredibly helpful. We've had a great success rate with students who have come to the reapplicant workshop and then reapplied the following uh, cycle. Uh, and they have really found that it was a, a great tool to have in their arsenal. Um, so this gives a, a full picture of our application timeline. So the MCAT is offered 20 times per year. Generally from January to July is when you're going to want to take that, um, that MCAT uh, in the spring semester of your junior year. The AMCAS uh, application, which is the application that we use and most medical colleges use, um, opens in May. The AMCAS deadline to have it submitted is October 15th, and I'll go over more of a suggested timeline that we suggest as an admissions office, but that is the AMCAS deadline, and then your supplemental deadline is going to be um, November 1st. That's sort of a secondary application, and then I mentioned before we offer interviews from October to January, and then you'll know something by the latest by spring break and then you will be matriculated into our incoming class in august so that's sort of the general timeline our suggested timeline we always suggest having our um your application submitted by august 15th and the reason we uh, we ask that is that this will allow you to be considered for our first round of interviews. Um, especially if you're a competitive applicant, you will be offered some of those first spots. So um, it's always good to have it submitted just a little bit, a little bit of time in advance. Uh, it also gives you just a little bit more time to have have some of your um, your additional items with your supplemental um, application submitted as well. Uh, and then for those who su submit their application by the deadline um, of October 15th, 
those are generally not going to be offered in interview until later on in the in the interview season. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're um, completing applications. It doesn't matter if it's for the College of Medicine or another college, always ask the admissions office sort of what their suggested timeline is because um, it may benefit you in the process. So that's just something to keep in your back pocket. So um, I have, I'm trying to wrap it up because I know I'm running short on time, but this gives you a good picture of sort of what your years at the College of Medicine will look like. An MD program is four years. Um, so years one and two are basic sciences, years three and four are, cl are clinical experiences, and then you have three to six years in a residency program of your choice. Um, during those times, you're going to take what is called the USMLE, which is a licensing exam, um, different steps. So step one is after year two, step two is after year four, Four, and then uh, step three, USMLE three, is going to be in after your first year of residency. And if you'd like to get further specialized on top of your residency um, into a, a much more highly uh, specialized field, then you'll go into an additional one to three years of a fellowship. Our MD PhD program is an intention an, an intensive medical education. Um, program. And like I said before, it is seven years. So you'll begin your first one to two years at the College of Medicine and then enter your MD program. Um, we offer programs in uh, biochemistry, bioengineering, cell biology, epidemiology, and biostatistics, and so on. Um, and this sort of breaks down um, a little bit more in detail. So the summer before your first year of medical school, you'll have a rotation. Then you'll enter year one. Then again, you'll have a 10 week rotation in the summer between year one and year two. Then in year two, you'll, you'll have your second year of medical school and step one of your USMLE and so on. Then you'll take uh, two years to complete your uh, PhD program with your dissertation and then finish up your medical school um, years three and four. So this gives you a picture of uh, the first year of medical school. It is 39 weeks. Um, and you can see that there are clinical rotations, et cetera. Then in your second year, it is 35 weeks. Um, it's just a little bit different, but kind of built basically the same. In the summer, you'll take your USMLE step one. Third and fourth year consists of clerkship rotations. So um, these, will, these will vary from student to student, but every single student will have each of these um, sort of the core uh, uh, clerkships and then you can you can select um, some alternatives uh, for six weeks as well and it will look different from student to student but that's what your third and fourth year is going to look like um, so wrapping it up a little about the uh, student life uh, aspect for College of Medicine students, uh, we have a class of diverse individuals. Um, we have students who uh, represent 46 different school schools and over 50 majors. So you don't, you know, the myth is that you have to major in biochemistry or biology, um, and that's certainly helpful. But and and of course, the mo vast majority of our students do major in those things. But we also have students who have majored in things like English, um, who have majored in. We've had one student who majored in dance. We actually have another student who um, went through a uh, physical therapy school and was a practicing physical therapist and decided that she wanted to go back and um, become a, a physician. And so now she is in our second year um, class. So you can come from various backgrounds. Uh, we, we definitely um, celebrate that in our students. Uh, we also have a number of uh, opportunities for students to get involved in. Uh, we have free healthcare clinics and health fairs. We have over 50 student organizations. We also have an Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement that does a number of outreach opportunities each year, um, supporting high school students and undergrad students. And we love it when our students get involved and partner with us because you guys, they are, our medical students are much more closer to you guys than we are on, on our end. And so we want you to have that uh, that experience with with medical current medical students who can answer your questions um, so just to wrap it up we ask that you um, follow us on Facebook uh, we are becoming much more involved into the uh, social media space and so um, please find us on Facebook our Twitter is a little inactive at the moment but we're going to get that up and running as well so please follow us um, for the most up-to-date events and uh, fun things that we do throughout the year. 
Um, and then if you want to get in contact with us at the College of Medicine and the admissions office, um, please feel free to reach out to us here. Um, you can always, if you Google search, I actually think our, our link here is out of date, but if you just Google search College of Medicine, uh, uh, University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, we will be the first thing that pops up. Um, my personal email is uh, left here. If you want to um, send me an email with any additional questions that you might have that you don't feel comfortable asking here. Um, and then if you want more information about the MD-PhD program, I am happy to direct you to them as well. So with that, that's, that's all that I have. Um, Jessica, is there time for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to open it up to both you and Julie. So students, if you guys have any questions um, specific to each school or just in general about uh, the med medical school application process, feel free. I'm going to um, allow everyone the opportunity to unmute themselves but also if you want to type those questions into the chat box you can do that as well so if you we looks like we do have one in the chat box already um would the interactions with patients as a pharmacy technicians be considered patient care experience it is for osu um i would i can't speak for ou but it is for osu we have students that have been pharmacy techs um before they started working or before they were accepted as, to medical school. Um, so long story short, yes, <laughs> to answer your question, yes. And I will second what Julie said. Um, it, it, it is for OU as well. Um, they, might, they might ask you that in a little bit about that in the interview process um, and why, why maybe you chose that versus maybe direct patient care, um, but it certainly is um, acceptable in our end. Um, as far as signing up for the tour, you can go to our website at medicine.okstate.edu and um, under the prospective students tab, then you can find out about the tours that we're offering right now. Plenty of time if anyone has any other questions. I want to give everyone a chance to think of think of them. Well, since there are no other questions coming in just yet, I'm going to go ahead and share some career services information. Um, and then we can circle back to some some questions if there are any at the end. Um, Another reminder, uh, if you check in for this session, you'll be entered in for our Science and Math Week giveaway, um, and you will also receive a recording of this session, so that way you have all of the information to uh, take with you. Um, but I wanna share some information about career services, and I'm so glad you guys mentioned the interviews and being prepared and all of that stuff, uh, because that's exactly what we do uh, in the Career Services Office. So it's never too soon to start preparing for interviews. Uh, the more you practice, the more comfortable you will be when you actually have to go in and do it, because uh, it can be very nerve wracking to be in there for an interview. Uh, so we do some personalized interview prep, and we do different types of interviews. You know, of course, one that's very important right now are virtual and phone interviews. Um, we also do traditional interviews, you know, face to face. Um, now we aren't doing those right now at the moment. We'll have to do everything virtual, uh, but we do personalize the questions. So, uh, you know, if you if you let us know that you're trying to prepare for a medical school interview, uh, we will tailor those questions for that purpose. Um, we also do uh, what's called a multiple mini interviews, and um, that's actually what this picture, these few pictures are here on this slide. Um, it's asking sort of. Uh, situational and behavioral questions uh, and it, it, it is used a lot in medical school interviews. I don't know if either OU or OSU uses these exactly, uh, but some schools do. And then we also have um, networking and um, 
etiquette prep. So just preparing to interact with people in a professional setting um, and uh, you know, knowing how to uh, carry yourself as a professional when you're going into these interviews and into these interactions. Even when you're just going on a tour, you need to be prepared to do that stuff. And just some of our contact information here. Um, I know one of you mentioned, you know, making sure if you are shadowing, if you are going into that setting, make sure you have professional clothing. We do have a professional clothing closet. So if you, if you are able to get that professional clothing on your own, please let us know and we can uh, schedule an appointment to take you to our professional clothing closet to make sure that you're prepared um, for those professional interactions. Uh, we also will look over your resumes. So uh, again, it's never too soon to go ahead and get that resume started. Um, and we can maybe help, you know, give you some tips for getting some of that healthcare experience. Um, they, they may want to see your resume when you're trying to get some of that experience. So it's good to go ahead and get that started now and then just build upon it as you're going on. And so that way, when you go to apply for medical school, you will be that much more prepared. Um, so again, this is our contact information. Uh, please contact us if you want to schedule an appointment for any of those purposes. Uh, you can also uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We give lots of resume and interview tips on there and you can get information about any of uh, these types of events that we hold on a regular basis. So I'll give it one more minute for questions if anyone has anything. Um, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Johnson and I had a question. So there are some classes here that are requirements for uh, TCC that aren't for LSU or OU. Um, what can I do to make sure that I don't get behind on my course track to be ready for medical school at either of these schools? That's a good question. Um, I think if you're hoping to attain a degree, associate's degree from TCC, then it's, a, it's definitely important to prioritize those requirements while you're at TCC. Um, and then once you transfer to a four-year institution, you can, you can very well prioritize the prerequisites um, for the, the, uh, the program that you choose to go into um, after you graduate. Um, one of the things that I did not mention, and I'll try to be brief about this, uh, is that uh, it's not necessarily required that you complete a bachelor's degree in order to enter into our College of Medicine. However, it is strongly encouraged um, because if you choose not to, to go into medical school for whatever reason, you want to have something that that you can fall back on. However, if you'd like to focus more on getting those prerequisites, you have that opportunity to do so without necessarily completing a degree. Again, strongly encourage you to complete your degree, um, but it's not necessarily a requirement. We require a minimum of 90 credit hours um, for admission to our program. So just keep that in mind. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, also maybe, uh, refer to your pre-med committee once you go to a four-year institution uh, because they can help advise you on what your course load is going to look like and what's going to be a realistic uh, path for you into medical school. So I just wanted to throw that in there. All right. I would agree with everything that she said. Um, I think that your advisors are going to be really important to help you to make sure whatever your major is to make sure that you're, uh, you're taking the required classes to meet the requirements for that major. But um, your pre-health advisors, your academic advisors will be able to help you to make sure that you're on the right path. And Chris, just to give you some encouragement, we do have some of our academic advisors here in this session. So they are staying knowledgeable about the admissions requirements for these schools. Thank you. I, I actually did notice that my primary advisor is in this uh, Zoom call right now. So. <laughs> Um, I have another question for Ms. Candice. Um, whenever I was reviewing the class of uh, 2023 profile, I noticed that along with volunteering and academic degrees, that there was a section on languages. Does knowing multiple languages make someone look more competitive for medical school? 
I think from a competitive standpoint, uh, it's not necessary, um, it, but it always helps. Um, so I wouldn't make a blanket statement that it would make you more competitive, uh, but it certainly is going to allow you to be more successful um, in, in medical school because you're going to be um, working with uh, patients from different backgrounds. Um, and we also offer, um, specifically we offer a, a what electives like medical Spanish um, that will allow you to communicate better with your patients, particularly in the Oklahoma City area. We have a large uh, Spanish speaking population. And so um, it really helps to have that as a background. Um, and we also have various organizations that we work with, um, with Spanish speaking individuals. So um, I think if you're looking for a, uh, an additional language, if that's something that you want to sort of beef up your resume, that would be maybe a great um, avenue to go to. Um, but again, not required. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that it makes you more competitive, but it certainly will aid you through the process. I feel bad, but I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, so another question that I have for both um, the OU and OSU rep, uh, representatives here um, is what percentage of master's students apply and get accepted into both of your College of Medicines? Um, honestly, I don't have that number off the top of my off the off the top of my head. Um, we do have some students that have been in master's programs before um, to strengthen their GPA or to be able to, um, uh, especially for students that may not have done as well in undergrad, um, to be able to show their how serious they are for medical school. Um, but as far as the actual percentage, I, I honestly don't have that number off the top of my head and like julie i don't i don't have that uh that percentage off the top of my head i will say that it's not uncommon uh that our students go on to a graduate uh, program before coming to see us um but again it's going to be something like julie had said um to strengthen their GPA. Maybe they wanted to get more research before they came uh, to College of Medicine. So it's it very, very similar. Similarly, a lot of our students do it and they do, they do it to sort of benefit and boost their application. All right, I have one last question. Um, so for Miss Julie, um, is the uh, graduate certificate in medical sciences available to everyone or is it only for OSU students who have been there for the full four years? It's available to anyone. It doesn't have to be exclusive to OSU students. Um, what the graduate certificate program is, it's very similar to a master's program except you're just, except you're getting a certificate. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, especially to strengthen your application or, or to show the admissions team your competency in these um, classes, then this is an opportunity to be able to, to consider that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, did anyone else think of any last minute questions? All right, well again, um, if you checked in using the SurveyMonkey link, you will receive uh, a recording of this session. So that way you'll have the contact information for uh, Can Candace and Julie. So that way if you think of any questions, you can always contact them. If you have any career services questions, you can always contact us. Um, but thank you, Candace and Julie, for sharing all of that information. That is so helpful for our students and so helpful for um, advising staff as well. And thank you all for attending this session. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Great, thank you.